Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator Bridges Long, who received a Doctor of Dental Surgery degree at the University of Toronto, and after graduation, she completed a general practice residency at the Boston Medical Center and a three-year prosthodontics residency program at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, during her residency in Pittsburgh, she earned a Master of Public Health degree. Uh, uh, following completion of this program, she became certified as a fellow of the Royal College of Dentists in Canada as well as the diplomat of the American Board of Prosthodontics. Ever since she has been in private practice in Midtown Toronto uh, for the past 15 years, and she has a long history of being involved in prosthodontic education at the University of Toronto, and recently joined fac as, as faculty as an assistant professor with a major role in directing undergraduate prosthodontic education. Uh, she has been recently named as an honorary uh, class member from uh, the 2021 and 2022 class and a recipient of, of the from, from uh, 2019 to 2020 of Dr. Bruce Hord Master Teacher Award. It is a privilege to have you on Dental Webinar Series today, Dr. Leong. Thank you, Yuval, for inviting me on your platform to share um, my presentation. So um, I told Yuval that, you know, I've been invited to talk about this topic uh, very frequently uh, about implant screw fractures. And so I just wanted to start by giving you a, a little bit of background why I started talking about it. The truth is it's something that I see a lot in my private practice. And it, it's something I see, and it's one of those things that, you know, it, it's one of those complications that it's, it's not fun to see because patients come to your practice they're unhappy and they, they, they want it to fix right away. And I thought um, I wanted to share with uh, the people um, how I manage implant screw fractures. And in fact, at the same time, about four or five years ago, uh, one of the outlet I have just from practicing dentistry and just to manage my everyday stress is I started a block. And this is my blog uh, out of my website where I just talk about all the dentistries, all the mistakes, all my insights uh, as a practicing prosthodontist. And on that blog, you will see that there are many different topics I talked about. Anything that came to my mind, I talked about it. And of course, one of the blog entries I start writing about is how I deal with broken screws. And as soon as I released that blog, uh, I knew it was an instant hit. There were so many activities on that blog, and so many views, and so many people commenting on that. I realized it's a topic that everyone is interested. Now, back then, as, a, as an ultra part-time blogger, and that means I probably only have time to produce a blog once a month at the time, um, I was still predictably getting a lot of views. Now, this was done a few years ago, just to show you the statistics that I had about 3000 views. Now it's about 7,000 views on just this particular blog post. And so I realized there's a lot of interest in that. And so what I started doing was I started writing a little bit more and I published two articles, one that I wrote by myself and one I co-author with one, some of my uh, colleagues in, in, in Toronto, talking about how I manage um, uh, um, uh, broken screws. And along that, um, 
more people have invited me to uh, give this presentation. So that's what I told Luvo, you know, I, I got a lot of uh, invitation about talking fracture screws. So this may be a topic that um, some of your, um, uh, your, 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 your uh, uh, visitors will be interested. So here I am sharing with you what I know about broken screws. So what do I exactly want to talk about? So these are some of the things I want to talk about. I wanted to start by saying, what are what exactly are screw fractures? You know, what do we mean by screw fractures? I also wanted to just kind of um, mention a little bit how common is this problem really? Um, before we can manage screw fractures, I think it's important to understand why screw fractures. Just understanding um, uh, why they fracture. And the meat of the presentation, what everyone wants to talk about, now that I have a, a patient with uh, broken screws, uh, how do I manage the situation? Um, that's really what a lot of people want to do because that's a complication now um, that we're seeing a lot. And, um, and lastly, I guess, just want to finish off my presentation is just to, how do we prevent that? Uh, this is really a really big topic in itself. I just wanted to give you some insights. It really deserves a separate um, presentation on itself, but I feel that it's always incomplete without mentioning that. So those are the things I want to, uh, um, to um, talk about in this presentation. So let's start by saying, what are screw fractures? So screw fractures really is just a form of dental complications. And in dentistry, we know we have complications. We have complications in restorative procedures. We have complications in endodontic procedures, in extractions, and no different in implant dentistry, we see a lot of potential complications. And I'd like to cite you and uh, just talk about this article that is so well uh, referenced all the time is that Dr. Charles Goodacre and uh, among other his colleagues have written this article back in 2003. And what he had talked about was just categorize the different types of complications that you can see in implant dentistries. And of the six categories, he had listed surgical complications, implant loss, bone loss, peri-implant soft tissue complications, mechanical complications, and finally aesthetic and fanatic complications. So under these categories, implant screw fractures really fall under the mechanical complications. So what other things fall under the mechanical complications? Is there anything that can fracture? Anything you can see that is related to the implant processes? Um, and including the implant itself, that fractures is considered a mechanical complication. So you will see uh, amongst um, this category, there, you know, if you, it's the acrylic fracture, the abutment that's fracture, um, and uh, the framework that's fracture, the retentive element of the uh, overdenture is fracture, anything that you can think of that fractures falls under mechanical complications. So what I wanted to point out is if you look at um, specifically regarding the screw, they have prosthetic screw loosening, abutment screw loosening, prosthetic screw fractures, and abutment screw fractures. So which leads me to the next question. What screw are you talking about? Why I always wanted to talk about that is I guess if you haven't been practicing implant dentistry long enough, you may only associate one screw for every implant. Is that, you know, if you're, if you're really new to practicing implant dentistry, you associate that, you know what, you've got an implant, you've got the prosthesis that may be the crown and you've got a screw that connect the crown uh, or the abutment to the implant. So in, 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 in essence, you're dealing with one screw with every implant. But if you've been practicing implant dentistry long enough and you've been in the beginning phase in the 80s and the 90s, you know that we didn't start that way. You know, knowing how implant dentistry has evolved is that when we started using implants for single tooth implant replacement, um, it was a very complicated component tree if you looked at it. 
there's the implant, there's the abutment, there's the abutment screw, and there's the abutment cylinder, and there's the crown that connects through the cylinder through a prosthetic screw. So if you look at these components for every implant, you're dealing with two potential screws, which isn't the standard practice nowadays. But I wanted to bring this up because as a dentist, um, as a prosthodontist, you will see implant dentistry that may have been done the last 10 years, the last 20 years, and last 30 years. And you might have a patient that will come with this design. And so you have to recognize that, um, that there's potentially two screws you're dealing with. And if you've been, you know, been familiar with uh, full arch dent implant dentistry on four on X type of dentistry, then you're familiar with the concept of that with every implant, you're dealing with two potential screw, the abutment and the prosthetic screw. So this is not new knowledge to you. So, but there are two different screws really with two different functions. And for that, they really uh, have different, um, you really have to treat them differently. They have different torque value. And so you have to realize they are not exactly the same screw. Prosthetic screws and abutment screws um, uh, are not exactly uh, the same screw and they have different torque value. Okay. Let's start with, you know, if you do have a patient that have a broken screw, so you say, or you have a patient that says, I think I have a broken screw. In my practice, definitely they come in all forms and shapes. And what do I mean by that? They might come to my practice with the whole crown intact and they said, I have a broken screw or I have a loose screw. That's what I was told by my dentist. I might get a patient whose implant crown is lost or um, broken off, leaving the abutment intact and part of the implant in the mouth. So they might present to you in this form as well. Or they might act also come in the form where the whole restoration or the abutment is completely separated from the implants and you will see the implants still in the mouth and maybe even the soft tissue covering the implants. And if you take an X-ray, you might see the fragment that is left inside the fixtures. So they come in all forms and all shapes and forms. And they all say that I have a broken screws, which leads me to um, the idea, I think um, broken screws, loose screws are what most people will call as their implant complication. When in fact, I think it's a misnomer because you haven't even diagnosed the case because they come in all so many different forms. Um, what I learned is that even though the patient call um, the practice and say they have a broken screws, I cannot assume it's a broken screw. Um, and, and when I was pre preparing this presentation, I read this uh, chapter um, by Harold Simon on um, uh, dental implant complications, uh, which was titled um, the loose implant restoration syndrome. Notice he didn't use the broken screws or the loose screws because in his chapter, he just kind of you know, describe all these little case reports, how he managed every single case it was beautifully written. And it really reflects everything that I have to face in private practice. Unless you start um, deconstructing what is inside this restoration, you really don't know what is the cause of this looseness. So instead of calling things the broken screws or the loose screws, I think we should start using this term, loose implant restoration syndrome. <coughs> and why I say that is that you haven't committed to um, the fact that it's a broken screw is because once you start labeling it's a broken screw, you have the assumption that you just have to deal with the broken screws. You may you think that you just have to retrieve the screws and maybe buy new screws and, and replace it and that's the end of it. And then the patient will be good to go. When in fact, it's a lot more complicated. <coughs> In his chapter, his, he lists that these are some of the differential diagnoses of the loose implant restoration syndrome. It could be the loose screw. It could be the abutment uh, screw that is loose. It could be the prosthetic screw that is loose. It could be the prosthetic screw that is fractured. It could also be the abutment screw that is fractured. It could be the framework that's fractured. It could be the implant that's fractured. 
It could be the restoration that got loose, that the cement has washed out and it's just a loose crown, or you're dealing with an implant that has failed. And definitely in my experience, when I've seen a lot of these um, cases where they all come to me with the chief concern that I have a broken screw or have a loose screw, they, after deconstructing the situation, they might fall into one of these categories. So my conversation with the patient is that, you know, before I start doing anything is that you might have a loose screw. You might have a screw that is fractured. It could be something inside the restoration that's fractured, even that maybe the implant has failed. I don't know which one it is until I start deconstructing the whole restoration. So I think it's very important to recognize that. Don't jump to the conclusion that it is a broken screw. If it is a broken screw, um, that that's how you're going to manage it. But when you start having patients that come through the, 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 the door and you haven't even diagnosed the case, it could be one of these potential um, uh, diagnoses. Okay. So if you do have a patient that truly has a, a, a broken screw or a loose screw, um, really how common is this problem? So I always wanted to look at that because uh, my, in my practice, I have, I, have a, I, have a, I have a very biased view because I see so many of that. So when I go back to the literature again, uh, one of Dr. Charles Goodacre's articles, when he talked about the clinical complications with implants and implant prosthesis, and he looked at in the incidence rates of these uh, um, complications. At the time, he said that the screw fractures is about 2 to 4%. And the screw loosening is a little bit higher at 67%. Now, when I look at these numbers, they're not very high. And also what I told myself, well, this is an article that was published in 2003. And that means this is based on implants that were mostly done before that time. And we know that implants before that time, in, before 2003, the implants that were done in the 90s were mostly external hex implants. Um, and we know that we kind of moved away from the external hex to more internal connections. So I was curious with, you know, with the different type of connections, has that um, change the incidence of this implant complications. And luckily, when I was digging into the literature, I came across this article, which is more current, uh, that was published in 2019. And that they uh, looked at, uh, for the same reason, they said now with more new implant design, has that changed um, in the incidence of uh, screw fractures of single or splinter implant prosthesis? And what he had concluded is that the screw loosening is still around 7% to 11%, but the actual screw fractures now is around 0.6%. So it in fact has decreased, which I always find that it's hard to believe because I see so many of that. And, I, and, and just by the pure um, interest in my blog on broken screws, I always wonder if it happens more in private practice that is not documented. Uh, and, and, and so I always have this um, interest where maybe it's happening a lot more than it's documented, but that's a, you know, a subject on itself on a, maybe a study uh, on, on a different day. So, you know, question yourself, you know, you know, with, with these numbers, uh, are, are these really uh, uh, true incidents or it's just underrepresented in private um, practice setting? So now let's get to understand how screw fractures, because like I said, before you can understand how to manage or prevent screw fractures, you actually have to understand a little bit about the screw mechanics. So that's what I wanted to talk about. So I wanted to go through a mental exercise with you guys. Um, in case you haven't learned about how screws work in an implant restoration, Let's think about this situation. You have a single tooth implant. Um, let's consider this, you know, you've tried this in, everything looks good, um, and you're about to insert it. And before you seal off um, uh, the access hole of a screw retain restoration, you need to um, torque the screw. So what exactly happens when you're torquing the screws? Let's go through that mentally, what happens. So you have a screw that is going to kind of hold the rest, rest, connect the restoration to the implant together through this screw. 
And ideally, um, you would need to have a torque wrench that will precisely al allow you to um, apply the right torque to the screw. But what exactly is this happening when you are torquing the screw? So when you have the driver that engages the screw and essentially you apply the torque, you are actually applying a rotational force to the, to the screw. So when you're applying the rotation of force to the screw, essentially what's happening is the screw is being tightened. As it's being tightened, what exactly happens to the screw? The screw actually elongates, okay? It elongates and when you, you, you know that it actually creates a tensile force inside the screw. Now understand this happens at a very microscopic level that you don't necessarily see with your physical eyes. But essentially, um, the torque that you're instructed to apply is supposed to apply within the elastic range um, um, of the recovery stage. So you're not permanently de deforming the screw. But essentially, when you're applying a torque by applying rotation of force, this screw will elongate. And in, in turns, it creates a tensile force in itself, but it's trying to bounce back because, you know, it's, your, this force is applied during the elastic recovery stage. You're not causing any permanent deformation to the screw, but that's how um, the material is going to react. You know, when you try and pull something away, it will create, it elongates the, the screw, it's trying to bounce back. And it's this bounce back that is going to create a clamping force between the components that are holding this together. And this clamping force is what we call, um, the, the magnitude of this clamping force is what we call the preload of the screw. So again, so when you tighten the screw, you're going to actually elongate the screw in a very microscopic level. You're not going to see it elongating, but what it does, it creates a clamping force, okay? A clamping force that holds the components together. And this clamping force is what we call you creating a preload to the screw. And that's going to hold this component together, okay? So if you understand this whole screw mechanics, you will know that whatever that's going to disrupt this um, joint assembly, this disrupt this clamping force is going to cause the screw to loosen. Okay. So really, uh, we're going to call this joint separating force. Anything that disrupts this clamping force, we're going to call these joint separating forces. So it's really easy if you start thinking about that. If you have forces, joint separating forces that exceeds this clamping force, then you're going to start disrupting and it's not going to be able to hold the, the components together. And you're going to start having screw loosening. You're going to start lose the preload and you're going to start seeing looseness in your restoration. Okay, so what are some of the joint separating forces that exist in the mouth? You know, intraorally, um, if you look at this, it's a lot of occlusal forces if you haven't managed properly. Off-axis occlusal contacts, lateral excursive contacts, interproximal contacts between natural teeth in the implant restoration. If it's excessive, that can also um, create a, a type of joint separating forces, protrusive contacts, parafunctional forces, and even non-passive frameworks that can create these joint separating forces. When components or the framework are not fitting passively, it's a, a, a form of joint separating forces. So the way I see it is a constant tug of war. You know, you've got this clamping force that you have established in your screw that's holding things together. But in the mouth, if you haven't managed these joint separating forces um, properly, it's going to pull them away. Can, and whichever one is, um, is stronger is going to one the war, and, and, and that's what you're dealing with. It's a constant tug of war between the joint separating forces in the mouth and the clamping forces that you have in your screw um, joint assembly. And so eventually, if you do have joint separating forces that exceeds um, 
the preload or the clamping force, you may start getting screw loosening. And if it's excessive, you can actually get screw fractures. Uh, that if you, you have a screw that's loosened and you try to keep tightening it, you're going to have fatigue of the material and that you, you may eventually get fracture of the screws. If you have um, a non-passive fit of the superstructure, that can also lead to screw fractures. So if you understand this really well, you know, a lot of the cause of the problem comes from force uh, mis, uh, inadequate force management and maybe how good the fit of your restoration is in that environment. Okay, so hopefully that will give you some insight of why do screw fractures. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about how do we manage screw fractures, which is really what a lot of people want to, to learn about. Now that I've got a patient in the chair, I've got a, a, a screw that's loose or a screw that's fractured, how do you manage it? Okay, so this is me sharing with you what I've learned over the years. When I started seeing a lot of that, there wasn't a lot of available literature for me to go by, but over the years, I start assessing the situation so I can create a strategy to manage them. <laughs> so for me, I look at where's the broken screw? Uh, the location of the broken screw. Is it above and below the first thread inside the fixture? <coughs> Immediately that tells me is easy to get to. If it's far inside the body, access and visibility is hard, which leads to my next question. What's the visibility and access of the broken screw? On top of where it is located inside the fixture, I like to see if there is anything in the way. You know, is the crown still intact? Is the abutment still intact? If they are gone, maybe there's soft tissue that's covering it, okay? If it's an interior implant, say a posterior implant, that also gives me an idea how easy to access the area. And I start to look at the, um, the amount of opening, the patient that can open, the angle they can open, how much interclusal clearance do I have to access that area? That get, gives me an insight how difficult or how easy it is for me to retrieve or to, to manage this broken or loose screw. If I can see the actual fragment, I wanted to use an explorer and see whether I'm dealing with a very a tight um, fragment that is stuck, or maybe I can see a, a loose fragment. Sometimes you, with an explorer, you can see a little bit of movement that tells me the fragment is actually loose, which immediately tells me um, the likelihood that I'm able to retrieve it or not. If it's, there's no mobility, I know I have to, I'm dealing with a very stuck fragment and that might require uh, more efforts. If, uh, if I can see where the fragment is, I wanted to see if the screw head is still intact. You know, sometimes if I can see it, I wanted to see if it's intact and I want to see if it's in a strip. Um, if I know that what type of implant, what type of screw it is, I wanted to know what type of potential driver I need to get to the screw head and the diameter of the screw head that I'm dealing with. Because now we're dealing with so many implants out there. They all come with different sizes and forms. Um, you really have to equip yourself with so many different drivers um, to manage these type of complications. So this is kind of my way of starting to assess the situation. But what I want to share with you is what I find uh, what other people have done. This is something I just came across on the website, you know, when I was researching this topic, just to see what has been written about this topic. And this uh, website talked about classifying the screw fractures again, um, along the same line, I wanted to see is this about the first thread or below the first thread, and is it mobile or non mobile? And based on that, he had categorized them as type one, two, three, and four. So it's really simple, but it just kind of gives you an idea that we all look for the same thing. Is it above the first thread, below the first thread? Is it loose? Is it not loose? Because immediately it gives you an idea how easy and how hard it is to manage the screw fractures. This is um, kind of um, um, a decision tree or um, 
um, uh, 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 the flowchart that was uh, um, published in an article. I, I co-author this uh, article, but it really was my colleague, uh, um, the, the periodontist who came up with this. And I wanted to share with you again, you know, he, he, he suggested just by trial and error, he came up with this um, decision tree or flowchart, how to manage broken screws. You start with a clinical assessment. You take an x-ray and you wanted to see, again, the space between the crown, the abutment. Along the same line, he's like, then he, 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 he wanted to look at the restorative assessment. Is there a crown abutment present? And then is it a, a screw that is tight or loose? So along the same line, you wanted to see if there is anything in between where it is below the fixture. But what I really wanted to point out is that what, you know, if you were able to um, retrieve the screws, um, the next thing he, he talked about, which a lot of people don't get to talking about is you want to evaluate the implant to see if there's any internal damage because of all the hardware and complication that had happened in the past. You know, even if you retrieve the broken screws, that implant might have been damaged. And he, 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 he recommended assessing the internal damage. And what I thought was really interesting is that rather than just by visualizing with magnification, he suggests taking a PVS of uh, impression of inside the implant which is, I, I thought was very creative. So I always want to share that because, you know, you can only see what you can see, but he suggested taking an impression after the retrieval and take out and look at the impression. So you can really see if there are uh, damage to the threats inside, which is quite creative. And, and, and so I always wanted to share that. And alongside, if it is uh, restorable, then you can restore the implant as normal. The, the last thing I wanted to share with this, this is the article that um, I came across um, that has been um, the most useful article I came across when I was, you know, um, looking at what has been published about managing screw fracture. There's a lot of case reports, a lot of case reports about a dentist or prosthodontist talking about what has worked in their hands. So it's very isolated case reports that may or may not work in your specific case. But what... Um, this uh, article had done is he, they pull along all, all the published articles about managing um, abutment and prosthetic screws and made it into a decision-making tree for managing it. So what he did was he, he they also have a little decision tree um, in assessing the situation along the same line, you know, can you see the set fragment? Is it loose? You know, if you follow the decision tree, again, we look at the similar things, you know, can you see it? Is it below um, the fixture level? Is there mobility? And then based on that, he suggested several strategies. But I really wanted to um, show you his um, strategies. He's categorized all these published procedures into low, moderate, and high-risk procedures. Really, ultimately, I think he's really set the stage how we should approach broken screws because there's so many documented procedures. Before you start I, I using any of the procedures, he suggests that we should always use procedures that have low risk um, procedures. And what is the risk that we're talking about? The risk of any retrieval procedure is the risk of damaging the inside of the implant. If you um, damage the inside of the implant, then ultimately you may end up not being able to reuse that implant for restoration. So um, he, 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 what he did was he, he categorized all these procedures to low moderate risk and also based on level of difficulty. So he suggested using anything that has the lowest risk to damaging the implant and things that are fairly easy to do to moderate risk and high risk. So I think he really kind of, you know, and that's something that I've been doing all the time is just not thinking about it. Always start with some of these documented low risk procedures. If that doesn't work, then I move to the next category without having to think about this um, 
uh, systematically, but what he has done, he's actually published it and talked about this is how you should be doing it. So I, I think that really set the new stage and, and, and standard how we should be managing screw fractures rather than based on case reports, what they did, what he did, what I did, what worked, what didn't work. It's that, you know, he had a, a more system, uh, a well-documented system that makes sense to me. So I think this is the best article that I've come across so far. So what I wanted to share with you, again, based on his, uh, his um, article, is that what are some of the low-risk procedure that we've um, talked about and we've, we've seen and used? Um, some of the, the procedures that have been documented is that, you know, using an explorer just to kind of uh, wedge between the fragment, if you can see it, and apply anti-rotational counterclockwise uh, movement and trying to engage a fragment, and hopefully you can back it up. Um, we also have seen people using rotary instruments in trying to modify the screw in one way or another with some sort of a burr. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, there's certainly screw retrieval kits out there um, that have been available for purchase for you to manage broken screws. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. And also, you know, one of the things is that um, once you've retrieved the screw, if there are some sort of maybe internal damage, um, some of the strategies you might want to try to re-tap the implant, redefine the threads inside the implant so that it can be usable. Okay, so let's talk about um, the low risk procedures. Okay, what has been published out there? Most of them are the, these low risk procedures are using whatever dental instruments you have at your disposal. Okay. Most of the time I've read about using an explorer, a curved hemostat, some sort of ultrasonic scaler, or even a spoon excavator. And if you have to modify them, then modify the instrument to fit so that allows you to engage or to get inside where the broken fragment is and hopefully you can engage it and apply some sort of rotation, vibration, or counterclockwise movement to get it loosened to so you can retrieve the fragment. And because this is the lowest risk that will result in the least um, uh, the lowest risk in terms of damaging inside the implant. Okay, so this is just showing you one of the cases that I did was that, you know, you can see this is uh, uh, two implants where the crown had broken off and when by the time I saw the patient, um, the soft tissue has already covered up this um, two implants. But to me, when as soon as I took the um, uh, an X-ray of this situation, I knew it wasn't going to be a heart retrieval because what I noticed is that I can clearly see the fragment. It's pretty much at the crestal level, so I know that as soon as I uncover the soft tissue, I would be able to see it. And, it, and if I can see it then the chances of me to retrieve it is much higher. And it's not so much deep inside the apical third of the implant, but it's more of the coronal third of the implant. And so what I actually did was I removed the soft tissue. I just incise and flap, just fold back the tissue. I actually use a combination of an explorer, wedging it, just get to loosen this part. And also I use a hemostat so I can retrieve this. Okay, so that is actually not the hard part. Once I retrieved the components, um, I thought maybe I can just order new screws and reinsert this implant uh, crown. So what I want to share with you is that when we order new screws, we couldn't fit through these opening. And if you look carefully enough, you can see the damage, the, the wear and bending uh, happening around this. So there has been some wear and tear happening at this connection point um, that has resulted in this whole complication. So um, the lab technician were, was able to um, kind of make some adjustment at this at the time. And we were able to finally get the screw to get in uh, to put this implant crown back on. But I did uh, tell the patient that it may be it's best to make new crowns um, because of the damage that has occurred at the connection point. And this is something that you will always find that, you know, when you have a broken screw, often it's not just replacing the screw. There's something wear and tear that happened over the years that you might 
need to replace it at restoration. In this case, we were able to put the screws back on, but ultimately um, uh, it was recommended to have new crowns made. Okay, so that is just, just an example of low risk procedures. Now let's talk about what are some of the documented um, uh, moderate risk procedures. Um, if you look at this um, kind of list, you will see that uh, the common theme in the strategies is you use some sort of rotary instruments, you use some sort of burr um, to engage the fragment um, and hopefully using rotational um, vibration um, uh, movement that you will loosen the fragment to get the fragment out. But that involves, in one way, modifying the screw in itself. And that in itself carries the risk of damaging the screw threads of the implant, depending on where the fragment is inside the implant. So a lot of the procedures talk about using some sort of a round burr. Or sometimes they have come up with certain burr. This is a fork shape and instrument that's been talked about that's supposed to have this, you know, teeth at the end of the, the fragment that allowed you to have a little bite on the fragment. Hopefully with that, with some sort of rotary instruments, you can engage the fragment and get it loosened enough. Then you can go back to some of the low risk procedures like using Explorer to kind of wedge it back out with um, counterclockwise movement. But it does involve some sort of uh, rotary instruments and modifying the screw in one way or another. Okay, so a very common situation is if you have a, a broken screws, I rarely see a screw that is like this well defined where it's if it's a, it's a cross, let's just say it's a cross uh, driver that you can use. It's probably by the time they come to my office, it looks something like that. And the challenge is you, the traditional driver wouldn't be able to engage this anymore. And, and so, and that's why you need some sort of a burr um, or, or, or to apply some vibration to the top half of the screw and hopefully to kind of loosen up with vibration. But one of the common strategy that has been shared and even as a resident many years ago, that was I was told, you know, you convert the strip screw to a slot so that you can use a slot driver to hopefully to engage that fragment and back it out. Okay, so that is uh, one of the strategies I've always used is if I cannot loosen the fragment with an instrument, with an explorer, with vibration, then I will start considering um, modifying the top portion of the fragment in, in the form to make it like a slot configuration. And that would allow me to use a slot driver, um, hopefully that I can engage that fragment to back it out. Okay, now one of the thing is that if you are doing that, you will find that whatever driver you have may not be long enough or thin enough, depending on the implant um, screw. And so what I find is I have a dedicated driver um, for screw retrieval where I can continue to modify this uh, end to, uh, so that I can reach deep enough to that fragment so I can engage it. I certainly don't want to modify my, my slot driver or my, my brand new slot driver just for screw retrieval, but I have one dedicated one that has a little uh, longer shank that allows me to reach um, dif dif different levels. And also if it's a very small diameter screw, then I might just kind of trim it a little bit just so I can reach it down deep enough to engage it. So that's a, a very common strategy that has been discussed and shared um, in, in managing broken screws, convert the screw head into a slot configuration and try to use your slot driver to engage your fragment. What I want to share with you this article is I thought when I came across this article is very, very um, creative. You know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of buying all these fan fancy schmancy uh, instruments, but I always want to use what I have at my disposal. This um, article recommended using brown burrs to manage um, 
fractures and plant screws. And what he had recommended is, yes, you can use a very small round burr to engage the fragment just to get loosened if you can. But he actually went as far as, you know, maybe you can also use your regular round burr, number one round carbide burr that fits into your um uh, uh, your your slow hand piece, your la ra latch angle hand piece, which oftentimes can fit into your um, torque driver if it's a latch angle connection, but use a heatless stone to convert this round burr to a slot configuration. Now, what you have is you now you just convert it into a round burr into um, a slot potential driver that you can put it into your latch angle um, uh, uh, hand piece, uh, put reverse or even in your um, driver handle so that uh, you can try to engage the component in counterclockwise to hopefully to retrieve it. I thought well, that was very creative in case you don't have all these fancy instruments, you might want to use this strategy to manage your complication because most of us will have round burrs in our office. This is um, an example where I end up modifying the, um, the screw to help me um, manage this broken screw uh, situation. So this is a patient that came and I show you at the beginning is the crown has already been broken. And what it has is it has two screws to it. There's the top screws and then the, the abutment, this is the screw. And so it has such a, um, a small screw. And by the time it came to me, it was so scratched up that I, every time when I end up trying to engage whatever is there is just, I, I call it dancing on the, on the driver. It's just not engaging. I couldn't put any counterclockwise rotation force to the component. And what I end up doing is knowing that this is an abutment um, that I probably can replace easily I actually end up flattening the top portion completely, remove all the scratches. Because what happens is all these scratches, you know, when you put your uh, burr on it, it just can't get them bounce back and forth. And that's my challenge. You have to have very steady hands and with ac difficult access and limited mouth opening, it's not easy. So in this case, what I end up happening doing was I end up just flattening the top portion of this abutment, completely flattening it just like that. And, and after it's completely flattened, then what I did is I went back to a carbide burr and refine it to a slot configuration. It's much easier to be able to drill on a flat surface than a roughened um, damaged surface. Uh, and I will only do it when I can see it. it's way above my implant. So I know I won't risk damaging the implant. All I'm doing is damaging this component. And that is something that I have to tell my patient, look, you're going to need a new component. Um, you can, you're going to need a new crown, but at least we can reuse the implant um, for restoration. So that is something that I often have to make a decision. Can I sacrifice the component, the crown to save the implant so I can more predictably retrieve the, the broken uh, screw? And that's what I did. Okay. This is a case where I have to re, um, remove a broken screw on this implant. This is an implant bridge. Um, it's a replace select. And I wanted to show you uh, at the end of the day, so I, I removed the screw, I put the healing abutments back on, you can see some bone loss. What I really want to show you is that even though it was a screw retained implant bridge, by the time I retrieve the whole, um, the broken screw, you can see this is the broken screw. You can see the access hole is much larger than the initial access hole, which is what I always wanted to um, point out is that when I start managing this broken screw, it's not actually a broken screw. You're dealing with a deformed screw with threads that may have been bent and, and, and damaged. And so even though I see the fragment loose inside the implant. I can't back it out um, until I create more clearance around the access hole. Um, I, I, I have to create more clearance, uh, a bigger opening 
to allow the screw to unwind itself occlusally. So I, I call it, I create a ring of clearance. Even the screw is much smaller because the threads are actually damaged, actually have to wind up itself and occlusally and I have to back up and create much more opening so that it can back itself up. So the way I want to explain to you is that if you have a brand new screw, you can really create a very conservative opening in the access opening because everything is all brand new and it, it's it's it, it's going in one direction. It's, it's showing you, you know, this is uh, the driver, you know, it, you don't have a lot of room between the shank and the opening because it's a brand new screw and it's not damaged. But when I find that when I'm dealing with a damaged screw, I have, even though I can see movement inside the opening, it's oftentimes binding against the walls of this access opening because the threads of the screw may have been damaged and for it to unwind itself, it needs a little bit more room to come out. And so I often have to, again, sacrifice the crown by creating a much bigger opening to facilitate this broken fragment to travel it up occlusally so it can be retrieved and you can reuse the implant. So that's something that I have found with experience I find myself doing is that I have to create a bigger opening than initially it had um, and in order to get this uh, fragment out of the implant. Now I want to talk about screw retrieval kits. And so obviously with this implant complications, there are many companies that have come up with these re screw retrieval kits um, to help you retrieve um, the broken fragments. I don't actually have these kits in my office because um, I, I find that most of my low risk procedures and, and moderate procedures have helped me to retrieve these components. But what I wanted to share with you is most of these kits have very common elements. They, um, they will have some sort of a drill. They will also have some sort of um, uh, uh, um, uh, drill bit for you to engage the fragment, okay? So most of these screw retrieval kits will have a set of drills of different dimensions, shapes, and length. And the goal is to engage the fragment so they can apply some reverse torque to back it up. Okay, so they can come with so many different drills depending on their drill kits. But the idea is just that it allows you to engage the fragment. So much like you can use your modified round bar, but they might have been longer, thinner, and then maybe better teeth so that you can engage the fragment. And, and so you might want to use that. But alongside is they will give you several drill guides, drill guides that kind of like sleeves that sits on top of the implant. And the idea is it will help you align the drills in a way that you can just focus on drilling the fragment. And hopefully that will minimize the damage on the walls of the implant inside. So these drill guides or drill sleeves will help you to align and angle the drill in a way so you can direct um, it in, a, in the same direction to minimize the damage to the internal threats of the implant. And the third thing that often comes with these kits is they have these retapping tools. If you do feel that you may have some thread damage, that they will give you these little tools to re-thread, uh, re-tap the inside, the internal structure of the implant. Hopefully you can reuse the implant again. So these are what retrieval kits usually come up with, and um, you can certainly try them. Um, and there's so many out there, um, and, 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 and they all come with similar elements, you know, with the set, set of drills, some drill guides, and retapping um, instruments. Now I want to move to the last category, high-risk procedures. Let's say, you know, you start with your low risk, it's not budging, you couldn't engage it, you try to modify the screw in whatever way you see fit, but it still is not moving. It's like you, you might say that it's cold welded inside, what do I do? So, um, or sometimes after all your screw modification, you end up, you know, you, you end up drilling and drilling and you, you, you drill all the, the way inside the implant that the internal threads are damaged to the point that um, any components don't, uh, any new screws don't really fit and engage the implant anymore. So if you look at these high risk procedures, it involves 
modifying the implants. Before you, you consider explantation, before you consider um, uh, removing this implant altogether or start all over again, um, some of these strategies involve modifying the implant. You drill it out and and, and an example of, uh, of, of a high-risk procedure is you, you, you drill out everything inside and use the inside of the implant like um, a cast pulse in core space, okay? So this is uh, an article where um, it, damaged, uh, it demonstrated that. So this is uh, an article where they talk about this implant uh, had a fracture locator above. And you can see that this is the fracture of, um, uh, screw inside the, 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 the fixture. And after screw retrieval, um, you can see that someone's drill inside and, and they've remove the fragment, but now it really doesn't engage. You cannot really find a locator abutment that will fit inside the space here. So this author, instead of um, rendering this implant non-usable, decided to make a cat's post and core and laser weld a locator to it and cemented it. Okay, so this is a cemented locator on this sign. This is a traditional um, locator abutment. So you can still reuse it before considering explantation. And this is the, definitely has been a documented procedure. You can use it um, in, in different um, uh, implant system. Um, and, and so that is the last resort before you can consider explantation. Okay, so this is, um, you know, just giving you a summary of the strategies, you know, they're low risk, you know, your goal is to use whatever instrumentation you have, use ultrasonic vibration, improve the visibility, use your instrumentation to engage a fragment in um, counterclockwise, hopefully you can get the fragment out. If not, you might have to modify the screw, you may have to use rotary instrument, use burst, engage the fragment, hopefully you can loosen it up and to get it back up and retrieve it. If not, you have to drill it out and use the implant in a way like a cast pulsing core, which carries the highest risk and the highest level of difficulty of doing. Okay, so those are the, some of the strategies, hopefully that will give you a sense of what you can do. Now, I just wanted to sum up some of the preventive strategies. And like I said at the beginning, it's really a big topic in itself, but really um, we'd like to prevent this screw fracture, this implant complication whenever possible. So I'm just gonna leave you four ideas to think about, you know, First of all, really understand screw mechanics. I talk about how screw works. Believe it or not, you know, as simple as using the right screw, using the right torque is very important. And so understanding screw mechanics means that you're applying the right clamping force to create the right preload that will hold the components together. The second thing I want you to think about is really understand occlusion. Occlusion is really the source of all these forces that's going to be applied to this joint assembly. If you don't manage occlusal force properly, you're really allowing these joint separating forces to exceed the clamping force. And to think on a higher level, really it all comes down to treatment planning. Treatment planning, how do you decide where to position your implant, how, how to angle your implant, um, the biomechanical consideration um, is very important. How do you decide how many implants, how to distribute them in the arch, how do you, um, uh, manage occlusal forces. Um, it's all about treatment planning your case properly. And the last thing is I want to talk about is make sure you understand the components. Um, I've seen people use incorrect components um, in their cases, and that became the source of the complication is knowing how to use um, what components you use in what situation um, so that you can create the right clamping force, right preload to hold the components together to prevent the screw loosening or screw fractures. So summary points, what are screw fractures? Really, it's a form of mechanical complications. I like to call these more like loose implant restoration syndrome. So we don't start labeling them as screw fractures because we really don't know until we start deconstructing the whole uh, situation. If it is a really true screw fractures, um, really studies show that it's anywhere from 0.6% to 4%. And I always wonder it's, if it's underdocumented in private setting. Why these screw fractures? 
It's because really the simplest sense is that joint separating forces exceed your preload of your joint assembly. How do you manage screw fractures? We'll start assessing the location, accessibility, the, is, is the fragment loose? What's the screw head stru structure? You know, that starts to allow you to plan your strategy. Whatever you do, start with low risk strategies first. And that may mean just using whatever instrument you have, modifying to fit to that situation to you so you can engage the fragment. You might have to modify the screws. And in the worst case, you might have to just uh, modify the implant um, to use it like a cast pulsing cord. And lastly, how do you prevent screw fractures? So four things I want you to think about, it really is a bigger topic in itself that I don't have time to cover. Understand screw mechanics, understand occlusion, treatment plan with biomechanical considerations, and make sure you use the right components. And that's it. That's all I have for you guys. I hope that um, the information is helpful for you guys. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I believe we do have a couple questions. I actually have um, a patient right now, as you were describing them. <laughs> I'm like, I need to, you know, go through, uh, go through your, 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 a method of trying to ascertain exactly where the fracture is. But uh, I guess we'll discuss it. Well, let's see what question we have here. Um, is uh, the qu first question says. Uh, what would be the likeliest uh, reason that the abutment screw of a single crown fractures within uh, within the hour of restoration uh, of, of being placed? I would say that it wasn't seated properly to begin with. I, at the dental school, um, I, I I find that. Um, there's a lot of screw loosening within the first six months. And we do a lot of screw retain restoration. And I, I think that, and that's where I, I think, you know, if you're new at inserting implant crowns, um, implant crowns don't have periodontal ligament. And so um, you may have gotten away with delivering a single tooth crown, um, tooth supported crown with maybe a little bit tight into proximal contact, maybe a little bit high occlusion, but peritoneal ligament uh, yeah. actually is, it gives you a little bit of um, a safe way and it, it kind of moves a little bit. And, and then, in, and then it, it's, it, it will kind of self-correct itself. Whereas for an implant crown, there's no ligament. So you got to be really careful of adjusting the proximal contact and um, the occlusion. So I think if it just fracture or brokenness or, you know, uh, I don't think the implant crown was seated all the way. And when it's not seated all the way, even if you torque it, I don't think it was creating the right clamping force to hold it together. And that is probably if, if it, it, it broke, it breaks, or if it's uh, in, in such a short time, and that means something is not right at the joint assembly. I just not see that it was the wrong screw or the wrong torque. Okay, nice, nice. Okay, uh, another question, does screw loosening uh, occur in both screw retained and um, cement retained cases? I don't know what, yeah. Okay, so what's the question again? Yeah, it, the question says, does screw loosening occur in both um, Screw retain or cement retain restoration? Retain. Yes, yes, they do. Um, uh, I, I find that they do. It's a little bit more uh, challenging if it's a cement retain restoration. I find that I see more of that years later. And I think that's because um, I see referral, you know, patient has a cemented implant crown in the front and then years later it got loosened. And, and you might ask why. I think the occlusion change, occlusion change, and then it start banging on that implant restoration and it, 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 it's loosened. Now the trouble is trying to uh, access that screw becomes a problem because it's cemented. And depending on what types of cement, um, I might have to drill through the crown in order to access the screw. Yes, yeah. I mean, so, so what I have uh, currently is uh, I've been so I, I, if I started with some mobility, so I, I figured obviously maybe, I, so it, it, it was mobile and it's, and it's, it's kind of, um, it's still in there, 
Uh, so we tried to to go through the access, find to find it. I think it was cement retained. So we, we did that. On um, getting there, uh, tried the, um, the the particular uh, you know the driver, and it wouldn't budge. And and the and you really can't see very well. That's to so that portion. And I noticed from the X-ray that the the screw head is very short, and that we are almost getting to the implant platform just from. Yeah, so I, I I closed back. I'm like I'm just gonna think. Uh, what am I going to do? You know, um, and it, we were short of uh, destroying the crown because at some point you have to the, the crown has to be sacrificed and his front teeth. So I was thinking if I take the crown out, what am I going to do? It's just too many things going in my head. <laughs> I closed it up. I said, you know, I'm going to come back and uh, maybe order a a, a a temporary abutment, you know, a temporary, you know, abutment, you know, crown so that I can make a temp just in case uh, that I'm not able to retrieve it. Because if, so once you are able to take the head out, what are the, the other parts that is in there? So if the screw is what's holding the crown to it, once you take the broken screw, the crown should come out, right? Yes. If it doesn't come out, there's something stuck. So that my next question, and maybe there is the abutment that is stuck and, 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 and that needs to be loosened up. So there is a, a change in, because of the connection change um, 20 years ago with mostly external hex connection, it's actually easier to manage broken screws because it's, if it's loosened, it's broken, um, you, you retrieve the fragment and the whole thing comes out easily. What I've seen now more is that not only are you dealing with um, the broken screw, now you're dealing with the abutment connection mm -hmm. that you might be dealing with an abutment that is um, damaged, uh, maybe cold welded with the implant, and that is also the source of the problem. So if you have removed the screw and it, and then this and, and there's still something holding. So my next question: There's some hardware um, connection problem. Mm, okay. Yeah, I, I wish you were uh, close. Uh, I would have sent. <laughs> I would have sent that patient <laughs> over because it is, uh, it's still it's still it's still a work in progress. Hopefully, uh, this week we would um, see how to fix it. That it's it's a real headache, believe me. Um, and it's um, an what kind of connection is it? What implant is it? Do you know? It's uh, it's um, uh, Biomed. Oh, 3i. Yes. Okay. So 3i, I've learned from my experience that people have placed 3i, but they would use um, Branamar components. I got burned once because I, I had a patient who, who told me that I have 3i implants, so I ordered 3i screws. And then once I were able to retrieve the screws, my 3i screw wouldn't fit into the implant crowns. And I took pictures and I thought, these broken screws look awfully like Brennamark screws. And so it was only because of my remembering that they happened to make, Bren they, they could, you can use Brennamark components on 3i that I ordered Brennamark screw to be able to help with, to, to put back the screws. So all these little information that's not official. Yes, it's, yes. It's, it's, it's like, you know, it's by experience and, and knowledge from, from back when, you know, and I, I feel like it, someone needs to publish this because it's going to be so unfair for people who just don't know this information. Yes, you're right, you're right. Uh, two more questions here. We do have uh, from Joseph from Nigeria. He says, uh, can the time of loading uh, influ influence screw fracture? The time of loading, you mean for immediate? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I can. Um, I would assume that's that's what he means by the question. But if if it's immediate loaded, then I would imagine that the implant is stable in bone and yes. work. You would be able to apply the the, the, the normal torque to the restoration. Um, then um, you should be able to um, use the screws. What I think is with immediate loading, oftentimes the restorations um, may not have fitted as well. I mean, if you look at traditional immediate loading, 
on for, you know, they, you take the impression, you convert the dentures to the implant on um, for restoration is all acrylic, right? And if you pick it up intraorally uh, with chair side acrylic, whatever material you use, there's an awful, there's a lot of uh, chromatization shrinkage error that can happen. So I tell you what I do is I, uh, you know, I know that the fit that is chair side converted may have some errors in itself. And so then when you're screwing it in, then you're, you may have not a passive fit restoration. That may be the cause of the, 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 the fracture and screw loosening. Okay. Uh, two, more, two more questions here. Uh, Mila, can you hear me? Yes, doctor, I can hear you very well. Yes, your hand is raised up. You have a question. Yes, I actually have four questions. Wow. <laughs> okay, Dr. Miller Joffrey is, uh, is calling in from Iraq. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, thank you for the extraordinary webinar, doctor. Thank you. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is the type uh, of system that's easy to retrieve? And a uh, screw system that's easy to retrieve. Is there any, any system that's easy to retrieve? Which is the easiest, you mean system? Yes, the screw. Uh, we have screw retrieval cases. kits? Uh, I think maybe implant system. I know you talked about external X and, and so is it yes, easier? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, Which yeah. So, so, you know, if you understand the history, when external hex system was developed, it was meant that the screw is the weak link. You know, they wanted to protect the implant from overloading. They're afraid that overloading the, the, the implant, it's going to cause bone loss. And it was supposed to be the screw that's the weak link. And if you have issue with the screw, then you, you, you retrieve it and you, you change a new screw. And so, um, and because of the external hex connection, once you retrieve the screw, once you remove the screw, it is so loosely, well, it, it is an external hex. It just doesn't connect to the implant the same way. Whereas internal hex or Morse taper type of connection, when you have a abutment that sits on this on the implant, um, it's much more stable. And so uh, and so now I'm seeing you don't see necessarily see the screw fracture, but you see the abutment fractures. And, and that's actually harder to deal with. You know, I see zirconia abutment fractures, and that's always a pain trying to drill that out. Um, and so that created a new problem. So if you ask me, what is the system that it's easy for screw retrieval, external hacks, but that's not what everyone is using now. Um, it was a system um, that was designed so that the screw was supposed to be weak link and it's, it's easy to fix, you know. Um, but because of that, that probably created a lot of screw related problems. And with time, people design better connection so that you know the screw join the screw is not the weak link anymore um but then it still doesn't mean that if you don't treatment plan properly the force the excessive force will cause something to break so break down and so it maybe it's not the the screw that's fractured now the abutment if you don't design the abutment well enough strong enough in the connection um that can fracture and that's what we've learned when trying people are trying to use a comey abutment um it or, or all ceramic abutment for aesthetics, those abutments always fracture eventually. I, I'm replacing these after 15 years. So now people talk about zirconia abutment, but ti titanium based connection because they realize they really need the metal connection. They don't, they, you can't rely on um, zirconia or ceramic as the connection surface to the implant interface. Right, I see, okay. <clears throat> okay, my second question is: uh, Would the uh, would the, the wrong video with the wrong video would the prosthesis break or the screw or the abutment or the all implant will fail? Which will break first? What is the first thing to fail there? If the video is not restored properly, yes, we know that the muscle will always win. You know, it's, 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 um, it's different for every patient, you know, it, it, it's like wear patient, you know, people who have bruxism, some people have TNJ people, some people wear at the tooth interface, some people um, have bone loss. And so um, it can manifest at different level, depending on the weakling of that particular patient. 
And so you might get bone loss around the implant, you might get screw fracture, you might get wear of the prosthetic material, you might get TMJ, maybe the patient is uncomfortable and complaining, I, I can't speak, I can't talk, teeth are clicking, you know. So I can't really tell you every, every patient responds differently if you really think that you violated the VDO. Okay, uh, my last question is, sometimes with crown and bridge, with a bridge, when there's a stress in the area, we'll break it with a mobile connector. Wouldn't it be useful with an implant to make the connection between the prosthesis and the abutment, like mobile, something that moves to break the stress, to break the torque, to break anything that is trying to uh, dislodge something or break something? So you're considering if you have a bridge is to use some sort of a stress breaking connector? Yes. Uh, would that be, uh, I can, uh, uh, would that be applicable with an implant? To, just to break the stress. What I can share with you, I don't, I, you know, I, I need a little bit more time, but what I can share with you when we started considering splinting teeth to implant, that was what was um, thought about with the PDL of natural teeth um, expected different mobility versus an implant that is also integrated with no mobility at all. If you were to splint teeth to implant, one of the consideration was to have um, a, a non-rigid connector to, um, to respect this differential uh, level of mobility. Now, this is not mainstream anymore because we actually see more complication when we do that. First, we don't usually believe in splinting teeth to implant anymore. And if we do what we found, if they do have these type of uh, attachment that um, have a resilient attachment, um, they actually see um, more complication um, with the tooth um, being um, uh, uh, separated, intruded from the restoration leading to cement washout. So I would think um, if you, you, you have a non-rigid connector, you will also have more uh, implant uh, related complication. Does okay, that doctor, thank you so much. Thank you so much for answering my question. Thank you so much. All right, all right. Uh, Dr. Anthony, are you there? Yes, I, I am. All right. Okay. I, I wanted to ask you a question. You know, you, I know you had a question on there, but I wanted to just read it out. And to... Okay. I, I, I want to imagine that uh, much of the occlusal uh, issues would be more in the molar area. So I wanted to find out if uh, the categorizations of the molars into type A, B, and C would uh, be uh, an important part in a strategy for preventing these occlusal, uh, these are uh, loosening complications. Sorry, can, I, I, I don't think I, I understood your question. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, the case selections in terms of categorizing the molar implants would be an issue with uh, the preventive uh, strategies for for uh, these uh, loosening complications? So for molar replacement, um, it really depends. It, it, it all starts with understanding the force um, when you're treatment planning for single molar implant restoration. I think that's what you're asking. Some of the things I look at is um, the patient's um, existing occlusal scheme um, is there a, a adequate posterior support um, in any uh, form of parafunctional habits? So even though the patient comes to me with um, wanting to replace the first molar, uh, my treatment plan can be very different. If the first molar is tooth bound with very stable posterior contact with canine guidance, this is a a much more favorable type of treatment plan for a single tooth molar restoration. If you're looking at the situation that the patient has no more molars and just want one molar um, and, and the patient has a very deep bite, 
Um, and, and the existing teeth don't have a lot of occlusal stop, stop, even though they actually have teeth, but they don't actually come in contact to distribute the forces, then this is a high risk type of restoration because there's, I'm expecting high occlusal force. And then maybe my treatment plan may not just be a single molar. Maybe I need to reestablish proper occlusal scheme of the remaining dentition. Maybe I would consider more than one implant rather than just a molar, I would consider two implants and splint it together to restore posterior occlusion. So um, those are the things I, I think about. And so even though with the same chief concern, I want to replace my first molar, um, my treatment plan may be very different um, for two different patients, depending on the occlusal scheme, depending on the force factors uh, and things like that. Oh, Thank you. Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 